now that we've covered some uh, silvicultural techniques, we're going to look at the process of forest management planning. Uh, in essence, how and when do we implement silviculture to meet the objectives of management, uh, which you guys all know by now can, can vary quite substantially. We're going to look more specifically at why we manage forest land at all and how a broad spectrum of management regimes ranging from very intensive timber production to full-on preservation uh, may contribute to a system of sustainable forest management. First, we need to recognize something that may seem really obvious but um, often gets, gets lost in, in these discussions of of how intensively we manage forest land or whether we uh, purposefully manage forest land or not. Um, the fact is that our forests do not require our management to function, right? They do not require us to uh, to function as an ecological system. The terms forest productivity and forest health are really laden with our values. You know, a forest is said to be healthy or unhealthy based on our subjective criteria. And there, there's no way around the fact that as biological organisms, we need to utilize our resources to survive. And forest land provides a renewable source of these resources to, to meet our own ecological needs. But trees cease to be renewable resources when our management actions result in the loss of soil needed to grow them. Also, when we are solely focused on, on harvesting, unaware of the rate of harvest versus the rate of growth and new tree establishment. Um, you know, our use is, is not sustainable in that instance. So without managing our use, our actions result in the degradation of forest resources, both to our detriment and uh, to the detriment of many other organisms as well. Just to provide a little perspective, um, there are 755 million acres of forest land in the United States, uh, give or take, you know, amounting to a, a little over 30% of the total land area. Uh, breaking it down a little further, land that we may classify as timberland or productive forest land that is currently not allocated to a use that would preclude timber harvesting. Um, that accounts for just 22% of the land base uh, in the United States. Reserved forest land, or land that may or may not be productive in terms of, of wood products, but, but is allocated to a use that would preclude timber harvesting, accounts for just 2% of the United States land base. So these are our national parks, state parks, wilderness areas, and other reserved pieces of land. Uh, other forest land includes land that may not necessarily be reserved for preservation purposes, but it, you know the the land is inherently unproductive or unproductive enough that there is no ability uh, there's there's no way for us to to grow wood products um, on any kind of uh, regular basis or sustainable basis. So this land accounts for just nine percent of the the total U.S. land base. Uh, so these are, are areas of forest land that are generally concentrated in the western part of the country um, that are, are, they are forest by definition, but, and they provide all the <laughs> ecological benefits of intact forest land, but they are less productive due to, to soil or, or other climate conditions. As we begin to, to look harder at some of these forest management challenges, it's important to also recognize who in fact owns the, the forest land in the United States. Uh, nationwide, just over half of the forest land is privately owned, uh, including small non-industrial private forest land owners and, and forest industry as well. There is a substantial difference between the eastern United States where the majority of forest land is privately owned and the western United States where the majority of forest land is managed by public agencies uh, like the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. So nationwide, there are 420 million acres of privately owned forest land with 11 million different landowners. Eight million of those landowners own 50 acres or less, which may seem like a substantial number, but in terms of forest management, uh, 50 acres really isn't that big uh, piece of land. Uh, another really important factor here is the, the fact that over 60% of private forest land is owned by landowners 55 years old or older. 
one of the management implica implications of this uh, demographic reality is that all of these landowners have uh, different management objectives. More often than not, they have several different objectives just for their own property. Uh, many private landowners are also reaching an age where they're beginning to look at options for either passing down their land to their children or, or another heir uh, or selling the property. These ownership changes pose a huge risk for increased parcelization and fragmentation of, of our country's private forest land. When you compound this with the fact that many of our large industrial forest products companies have sold off much of their land over the past decade as well, uh, you begin to see a really significant threat to large intact pieces of working forest land. The challenge faced by future foresters is in how to manage smaller pieces of forest land in an ecologically and economically beneficial way. This map provides an illustration of the forest land ownership pattern in the United States. All the colored area represents forest land. The yellows, oranges, and reds represent privately owned forest land, while the blue represents public agency land holdings. Um, and so you can see much of that is concentrated in the western United States. There's a pretty, pretty stark contrast between the ownership pattern of, of forest land in the eastern part of the country versus the western part of the country. Uh, before we get into some of these principles of management planning, uh, we really need to, to start to uh, talk about some of the ways in which we as a society have had an impact on the forest resources of this country. The, the first, and I guess maybe the most obvious, is that through, through different land use practices, we've altered the actual amount of forest land present. Uh, the two primary land uses come into play here, the conversion of forest land to agricultural land and the conversion of forest land to residential, commercial, or industrial development. Since colonization, we have converted about a third of the original forest land uh, in this country to some other use. Uh, interestingly enough, in the southeast, uh, here in the southeast, there has actually been an increase in the amount of forest land since the mid-1900s. Um, you know, mostly a result of farmland abandonment as fewer and fewer people uh, today make their living as farmers. The pattern is, is of less farmland and more houses or other development. The pattern of development is of equal importance to the amount of development, again based on the effect of forest fragmentation on wildlife habitat and the effect of fragmentation on our ability to meet the needs of society through forest management. The smaller the forest parcel, the fewer the management options a landowner typically has. Uh, particularly in regards to commercial timber harvesting operations. Our policies regarding forest fire in all of their iterations have, have also had an impact on the ecological, ecological characteristics of forest land in the U.S. Uh, more specifically, our policies regarding uh, fire ranging from a complete disregard for the impact of, of rampant fire on soil quality and, and ecosystem function characteristic of the early 1900s to the full suppression policies adopted in the mid-1900s to our recognition today of, as, of fire as an essential ecological component, uh, particularly in the western part of the country. Um, you know, all of these changes in philosophy of all and changes in management and, and changes in fire use have altered the characteristics of pretty much all of our nation's forest land. Today, the scientific discussion about wildfires in regards to which fires are to be suppressed, which fires uh, should be introduced through prescription, and which are which should be allowed to burn, um, you know, particularly on, on public land. This tends to be a really messy affair, right, particularly the, the let burn policy um, as occasionally implemented on public land. Uh, a good example of the complications wrought by our, our fire management policies are the, the wildfires that burned through Yellowstone National Park in, in 1988. In that year, approximately uh, 800,000 acres, um, I think nearly two-thirds of the park, burned, uh, resulting in, in ecosystem alteration for sure, you know, changes on the landscape, but really it, it, it caused a lot of social unrest as well. Um, and this was a result. This was a result of the cumulative impact of both our fire management decisions and a particular set of environmental conditions that were present at the time. Uh, fire suppression for for multiple years throughout Yellowstone is really not the 
not solely to blame because there, you know, there had been several large fires in previous years that had burned substantial areas uh, before they were suppressed. Um, you know, our actions or lack of action in combination with ever-changing environmental conditions set the stage for that event. So as a society, we've also introduced several non-native insects and non-native diseases inadvertently into our forest ecosystems. Uh, we've already discussed the impact of the hemlock woolly adelgid on the, the forests of the eastern United States. Another, um, another glaring example of, well, n not an introduced insect, but an introduced disease, uh, which has had a drastic effect on the forests of the eastern U.S., is the chestnut blight. Um, the chestnut, the chestnut blight was introduced either on imported lumber or imported planting stock uh, from Asia around 1904. The, uh, just to put this in perspective, the American chestnut was once a huge, uh, you know, major forest ecosystem component in the eastern U.S., particularly in the southern Appalachians, prior to the introduction of the blight. Uh, the mast produced by the chestnut, the actual chestnut, was, was highly valued as a wildlife food source, and the lumber was highly valued as a building material. Um, additionally, it was a highly competitive tree. It regenerated really well through seeding, through sprouting. Once an area was harvested, it grew very quickly. It, grows, it grew to be a very large, straight tree. It was kind of kind of a super tree um, in, in the woods. Um, but the chestnut blight, which is a, a fungal disease that enters the tree through wounds um, and, and damages the vascular cambium of the tree, uh, has caused the, the loss of this species. Um, the loss of this one species was a, you know, really a major ecological and economic uh, event. It had pretty, pretty substantial ecological and economic consequences. So American chestnut still found today in the woods. Um, but it rarely exceeds 10 feet or so before it succumbs to the blight. Once killed, it, it typically resprouts from the stump, but certainly uh, not what it once was as a component of our, our forest ecosystems here in the eastern U.S. So we've had uh, an impact. We've had a substantial impact in a, in a variety of ways. So the, the whole process of forest management is intended to recognize the nature of our impact. It's, uh, it's intended to understand the extent of our needs and in the context of the limits of our forest ecosystems come up with a plan to meet those needs. Uh, forest management occurs at the stand level. As was covered in last week's module, a stand is a contiguous area of trees sufficiently uniform to warrant the same type of management. Along these same lines, the forest stewardship is really an ethic, an ethic recognizing both the economic and moral importance of using forest land uh, sustainably so as to not ecologically impoverish uh, future generations. Just to piggyback on the silviculture lecture a little bit, uh, you should all be aware by now of the importance of using the terminology of silviculture um, as it ap appropriately applies to forest management activities. You know, if you drive down the highway and see 25 acres of vegetation that's been removed, you now understand that there's a fundamental ecological and social difference um, if the purpose of that vegetation removal is to allow trees to reestablish or if the purpose of that removal is to allow for the building of a parking lot. The former may accurately be described as a clear cut, the latter may not. Uh, for this reason, uh, clear cutting is not synonymous with deforestation. A clear cut portion of forest is still a forest, just in a, a different successional stage.